Dear viewers, to discuss the budget 2024, we have Ms. Nana Lal Kidway with us, the distinguished banker. Ma'am Nana Lal Kidway is Chairman Rothschild India and Senior Advisor, Advent Private Equity and a non-executive director on the board of global and Indian companies. Uh, she's also the past president of FIKI. She retired as executive director on the board of HSBC Asia Pacific and chairman HSBC India. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you for being here with us. Very happy to be with you, Jay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, you know, ma'am, I know like I'll open this whole uh, discussion about the budget because I know uh, right now you're leading a very important program on sanitation in India. And this budget has been talking about, uh, you know, about women and we've seen like, you know, from open defecation to Swachta Abhiyan and now the budget is talking about housing for all. So what is your opinion about uh, this move, move of the government from sanitation to housing and, uh, you know, to more uh, better way ahead? We want to know your views about it. So Jaya, uh, I should just state that it has been a very exciting journey for us at the India Sanitation Coalition, the not-for-profit that I founded and which I chair, because it's been this amazing journey working with the government, with the private sector, with the not-for-profits on this agenda of uh, building toilets, behavior change, and then working on the treatment of what goes into the toilets because it would be a real travesty, a real tragedy if we put all this shit into the toilets and then went and distributed it back into the fields rather than treated it. And this journey has been amazing because what we have seen through the government, starting with our Prime Minister's announcement within two months of his taking charge as Prime Minister for the first time, uh, the announcement of building toilets for all Indians. And with that came what is being recorded now as one of the biggest behavior change exercises by the country, by any country. And that is the behavior change to get people to use toilets. And then having done that, we've now given access of toilets. We've gone from 40% only Indians having access to toilets all the way to near 100%. And this became possible in what is really a short period in the country's history of uh, five years. So an amazing program and one which I'm glad to see continues to get the focus of the government and the ministry. So it's not like the government has moved away from sanitation water. There's a huge program which we are working on now called the Lighthouse Initiative, where we are bringing the private sector into partnership with Gram Panchayats to ensure that these villages remain model villages or that they can become lighthouse and model villages if they're not quite there. And that program includes water, sanitation, making sure that the community water bodies, wells, etc. are well maintained. And also now plastic, which, as you well know, is a real issue. So the budget, this interim budget, has not scaled back the money. It's increased it marginally to continue with this program. You asked about affordable housing. I think it is a great program uh, to provide housing. And there's mention also for the middle class to be able to move from rented to ownership. The affordable housing program is, of course, uh, caters to a much uh, lower uh, uh, section of society. Uh, this has huge advantages. One is, of course, giving a home and roof over everyone's head. And the other is it gives a boost to the construction sector. And a boost to the construction sector means many industries like steel, cement, etc. Uh, benefit. You get jobs because the construction sector is the second largest employer in the country after the tech and IT sector. So it is actually a brilliant move of this government and has been in terms of the affordable housing program. And the real estate sector loves it and the economy loves it. So you've said like the real estate sector loves it and the economy loves it. 
and a lot of people are saying that this budget is a non-populist budget they are not uh, so it's nearing to the election and they are not really doling out some sectoral or regional uh, schemes and uh, but some are some are also saying that oh it is it's a more of a social budget it has a less opportunity or less to say uh, for the business sector or for the corporate sector so you know with the government's focus on infrastructure we've spoke seen uh, the finance minister talking about the infrastructure she's talking about the physical deficit and more uh, you know capital expenditure on part of the government so how do you see this is it a is it balancing or is, is it a legit uh, criticism saying that it's a socialist and not a budget for the business sector uh, so i should start by saying that someone like myself was quite surprised that the finance minister announced a fiscal deficit stricter than what that had been originally set up by the government last year which was to achieve a fisc of 5.3% and instead what has been announced is 5.1 a populist budget would not look at scaling back on funding uh, and limit itself to a fiscal deficit which is stricter in an election year now within that capital expenditure which has been a very good program of governments from the outset and has saved us uh, from sinking into a very uh, distressed situation as the economy goes was the capital expenditure program of the government and that continues with an 11% increase now some argue that there should be more capex for india uh, you know we can do with capex at any level uh, but the fact is that it has increased and it has increased despite the fiscal deficit being reduced the capital expenditure benefits everyone it benefits industry because logistics improves which means the pace and speed at which goods move through the country goes down and that reduces interest it reduces costs it increases productivity on the other hand it helps every one of us as citizens it helps the villager get uh, to uh, get its produce to the markets faster it helps you and me when we travel so the benefit is a social benefit when it comes to capital expansion industry by the way benefits the most because they are the ones who make the cement the steel that actually do the construction so it isn't to my mind uh, an issue on whether we table it as social cause that, that is you know the infrastructure construction area or industry because both are benefiting on social programs there has been no significant cutback one could always argue that we thought in an election year government would put more money in but i think what the government is very rightly saying is that there is enough money already being spent the ability of the state and of the village the gram panchayat to absorb the money that is being thrown their way over the last few years is what remains an issue and i can tell you that from the experience we have in water and sanitation where most recently the lighthouse initiative program which we are running with the ministry of drinking water and sanitation has come about because the ministry says we have put money into the hands of the states and the gram panchayat and we know it has not been spent and we don't want it to lapse so can we please get private sector that is companies to come in not for the money but for their ability to make sure the money is spent so that these gram panchayats can become model villages that can use the money we have given them to ensure that they they provide all the services that we require them to to their uh, village dwellers so that tells you that the ability down at the grassroots to see through programs which the government has put ahead with a lot of vision provided funding for is also an issue so just continue to throw money into the pot when it isn't being spent or the ability for it to be spent is slower than it should be does not help and so i'm really arguing is what are the areas where we should be spending more money that can be used right away rather than we allocate money which has not been spent and i think what the government has really taken a stand is it is developing for the future it is not about throwing uh, benefits the way of an electorate to find 
there are freebies being given. So it's the old uh, logic of you give person a fishing rod to fish. You don't give them the fish. You teach them how. You take them there. You give them the ability to do that. And of course, at the margin, as happened at COVID, if there are issues around food and uh, actual availability of goods, you do have to give out the door. But I think I am certainly uh, very, very uh, encouraged by both the direction of this budget and the fiscal profligacy, which could have happened, but in fact has been contained with the desire to spend money, spend it well, and not go overboard and come back on the path of uh, a proper fiscal program. I see a huge change because we, we've come a long way. I remember you, you've been a pioneer in women rights. I've seen you speaking about uh, when this uh, res women reservation bill came. And, you know, we've, I think we all have seen the journey where we've seen a head of the state, one of our prime ministers, stating that, you know, the money that when, you know, the central government allocates and by the time it reaches the last person, it, it gets to the least, uh, you know, margin of it. Like it's, you know, 20, 10, 10 pesa from one rupee that reaches the person. But today, uh, you know, hearing it from you that today the government is focusing not only on the allocation of the budget completely to the uh, you know beneficiaries uh, where it has to be spent but making sure that it is spent judiciously and it is creating the change and impact yeah. that it is intended to so it's a wonderful journey we all have seen coming back to that when you're talking about that the government is ensuring it what are your opinion about uh, the direct benefit transfer so we are saying we've uh, yeah. we've blocked the leakages here so uh, some amount the transfer of 34 lakh crore to the you know people uh, uh, for whom it is intended they are being coming out of the sustained poverty and the things reading and because now you know it is why your opinion matters because you've seen at the helm of the corporate uh, scene and now you're working way into the communities to the last receiver so your opinion on that, that how this is impacting the political as well as like the economic paradigm of the country and how does this budget, you know, uh, reflect upon this fact? So, you know, you ask about the direct uh, bank transfer scheme and of course it is uh, one of the big enablers that has enabled any program funding to go direct into the hands of the beneficiary. Uh, earlier we didn't have the bank accounts. Uh, we didn't even have a full roster of who was uh, uh, below the poverty line and deserving of some of these subsidies. So by virtue of having the bank accounts opened, we now have direct access to those that need support and help. And I think it helped us over COVID where support was provided and could be reached to individuals directly. And it is clearly a way now for subsidies to be given away from the days when we had ration shops that were delivering food and food items and always complaints on poor quality of distribution and corruption there, to the money which now they receive in hand and they can go purchase what they actually need. So the direct benefit transfer, the direct bank transfer, which enables these benefits to go, is clearly the way to go. I think as we go forward, uh, it is uh, helping our people also understand all the programs that are out there. Uh, access to internet is an issue for many. They don't know quite what programs are there and how to access them. So support and help, both in terms of access and on the other, the, you know, just the dissemination of information uh, on what programs they can avail of are important. And we really need... Uh, whether it's uh, ASHA workers or not-for-profits working at the grassroots level to keep educating people as to what their rights are, what they can actually avail of, and on the other hand, how to do it. But programs there are, and they are very well structured uh, to benefit a uh, society that needs it most. So uh, you, you did just mention about uh, the, you know, how uh, not only the uh, so we've spoken about this yes it's reaching the last person and obviously the awareness advocacy and you know education educating the people 
is there. But I'm coming back to a previous point that you just mentioned, uh, you know, talking about logistics, that, you know, when logistics improve, everybody benefits, whether people or whether yeah. the, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing sector or the business sector. And there's a lot of emphasis that the government, uh, you know, announcing the budget has said, you know, including the rail corridors, the one day Bharat standard for coaches. And, you know, how do you feel that these initiatives strategically contribute to the economic growth? Uh, and yeah. while we, when we talk about what you said of the logistic development impact, but taking uh, the benefits to the, uh, the most uh, uh, remotest and the interior and the people who really do not have the direct access. So I was listening to uh, uh, some of the post-budget uh, conversations by uh, our Minister for Railways and uh, the vision that the country has uh, to enable greater, better access. And, you know, railways has been a great story for India from British times. Uh, the fact that we have these uh, railway access points are very helpful. It's also a very green method of transportation. Uh, it's one which many countries around the world uh, now use. And he mentioned that the plan we have of re, uh, you know, putting more rail track in is what covers all of Switzerland. So we are adding a Switzerland of rail systems and Switzerland has one of the best rail systems in the world uh, every year in terms of our plan. Then there was mention of uh, converting bogies to Vande Bharat bogies. So again, the quality of bogies being increased. We need more. You know how full our coaches are when uh, ever you go to stations, you see how crowded our stations are. Our people, we are all so used to using trains, but access to trains on the days you want to travel is not there. So that increasing of capacity is very helpful for citizens. Equally important is the announcement of the three economic corridors, uh, which is to help with the transportation of energy, cement and minerals by rail corridors. What That has two benefits, right? So one is your big massive goods that otherwise go on the roads, get taken off the roads. So it frees up your roads for other things. It puts it on trains which are faster, more efficient, less accident prone. And you get this double benefit in terms of improved logistics on the one hand and on the other, environment friendly uh, logistics because uh, you're not relying on fossil fuel driven trucks, but rather on rail uh, movement. So uh, it's a massive program, three new economic corridors uh, announced as they were. I'd love to see, of course, uh, the new rail uh, stations that are being planned. Uh, the program certainly sounds like they're going to look like airports, which is fantastic, you know, with uh, all the facilities. And of course, I really look to see that the quality of the toilets that we have in these railway stations are right, that they are properly cleaned, used, and indeed follow the path that we have seen now in malls, uh, at petrol pumps, where the quality of public toilets that were available uh, have improved so significantly. So uh, you've given me the hint to my next question and you know uh, I'm really enjoying the optimism coming from an expert here and uh, the thing that you know you, we're talking about sustainability and uh, lacking you know re uh, railway reducing our dependence on the fossil fuel so the green economy uh, economy strategy was also spoken about and you know whether we are yeah. incentivizing the solar energy adoption and providing viability gap funding uh, for the offshore and wind energy how do you see you know because uh, we are we are so this is very op um, like quite a bold vision i would say to talk about economic growth to talk about uh, you know reaching the top five global five economies we are talking about being developed by uh, you know uh, 2047 uh, and then we are talking that we are not going to do this uh, development without being sustainable. We are talking about green economy, uh, economic strategy hand in hand. So yeah. your, your views on that, how, is it, um, how, is, are we being really, is it a long shot is, or is it really practical, achievable? Uh, what are your views on that? So India's done really well on solar. Yeah, a great success story. 
one which uh, we set out uh, to achieve uh, over the last uh, decade. It's been amazing in terms of uh, the price of solar having become so competitive that earlier our worry was that solar was more expensive than uh, power as we were used to, thermal power. But uh, today that is not the issue. Uh, this commitment to wind is good. Uh, we have had wind energy. It needs a little more push. So that's great. And there was uh, also mention of biomass. And biomass helps the farmer as well because he can sell his surplus uh, fodder, uh, otherwise going to fodder uh, stubble and so on, which is not the food, agricultural residues exactly, into uh, an energy program. Uh, so the use of biomass is again quite important. So for India, where we are so dependent on fossil fuel uh, uh, electricity and 85% of what we need is imported, that anything we do to reduce our dependency on fossil fuel electricity saves the environment for sure, but it also saves us precious foreign exchange. So there can be no argument about the fact that we need every type of energy. And uh, while it wasn't mentioned in the interim budget, there is a huge push by Niti Aayog and by the government for green hydrogen, which is, as you know, produced from water. Uh, it uh, separates the hydrogen from water. And uh, we are able to then use that hydrogen as energy as well. So all of this innovation, experimentation in green energy is helping. But no matter where and what we do, uh, we are still dependent on fossil fuel because with all of this, we get to maybe 30% of green energy. Uh, we can maybe envision over the next few years to be at 50% because India's need for electricity and power is also growing in leaps and bounds. So it's very difficult for green energy to catch up all the way. But the good news is it is high focus. And we've had good success in the journey that we've started on in terms of increasing our mix of green energy. And there's a push, a regulatory push by government in the interim budget, uh, a big push now on rooftop solar, which is, again, great because anywhere where you have a roof on which you can put a solar panel, it can be now mandatory for a grid to buy that energy from you. Uh, so you don't have to store the energy, which is a high cost because of the battery. Otherwise, the just putting the panel and providing the connection, the grid buys it from you and it sets it off against your electricity bill. I have it in my home because the Delhi government uh, has provided this grid connectivity to us for solar, for example. And it is seamless, it really works, and your electricity bills come down enormously. So this rooftop solar program, which Saw mentioned, is a, a big push for us, and it can help at village level, uh, where it's really sometimes even reaching villages which otherwise are not connected to the grid. It could be the only source of power, because getting electricity to that village, because it's so remote, might be an issue. And it certainly helps in the urban environment. So every type of energy helps. There was also mention about electric vehicles and uh, looking at charging stations. And specific mention was made of uh, electric buses. So again, looking at transportation, particularly closed loop transportation like you would get in a city. You know, a bus goes from bus stop to a depot, is able to recharge and come back are ways that I think uh, we will see the electric vehicle market take off in the country. So fleets of taxis, uh, some of the delivery stations, e-scooters, which has been, again, a good success story, are all ways which uh, we will see the e-vehicle market taking off in the country. So in your words, uh, it's totally doable and the government is actually leveraging on what it has already tested and on the success stories. So one thing, you know, it might yeah. not be directly related to the budget, but ever since you've spoken about it, it's just there that I have to ask you this. So you've spoken about that, you know, we did not even have bank accounts, you know, a lot, lot of people. So almost a huge population of India did not have a bank account then. 
and there was since uh, the, when population lacked bank accounts there was no point of you know direct benefit transfer and you come from uh, the banking industry so if we talk about like two ways so opening up of the bank accounts how has it impacted both ways the people of india and the industry in terms of uh, you know this jandhan yojana uh, program that was done and you know opening of the jandhan accounts now a lot of people have access to upis everything so how do you fit this particular effort into the growth story of india well it's a very important story and as you rightly pointed out it has helped uh, the whole digital payment system where our country now has i mean it's doing something like 60% of all digital payments anywhere in the world happen in india and you know how whether it is your vegetable vendor or uh, you know small transactions of 10 rupees can be paid through this system it is hugely efficient uh, it's uh, been quite uh, uh, relatively speaking fraud free and it is now a system which is being lauded as one of india's big successes and there are countries around the world that are asking for us to provide guidance on how they can build the similar infrastructure so we have created uh, through the payments infrastructure on one side and the ability of an individual who hesitated to open a bank account was fearful of walking into a branch didn't know how to open the bank it's now become their birthright to have that bank account and to understand that they can put their money in that the money is safe and that they can transfer money as readily as they are doing digitally uh, in any case so a huge change i think it was helped enormously through covid as well because people found that it was the only way when going to banks was difficult paying money was difficult uh, and it moved a very large section of society online people who might have taken a, who would may have got there but it just got everyone there much much faster than would have been in the ordinary course. a very brilliant perspective saying that you know even the geographical diversity and difficulties that we we face you know so when you cannot uh, go to the bank but in a safe manner the bank yeah. has digitally come in your hand and that's what absolutely that's what jandhan has actually enabled uh, with us so one final yeah. question and think of the safety think of the safety angle right and women in particular if you you don't have to carry money to the market uh, you can do everything uh, digitally uh, the dependencies of you know cash moving uh, from one part to another to pay for goods and services uh, has gone it it's it's really the money trail that government needs can be established uh, where is the funding come from and i'm sure in the long run it will help when we look to trace like terror trails of money and cash movement it's certainly helped in terms of tax collection because it also provides a trail of uh, where the funds are so many benefits to a digital payment system uh, are already evident for us yeah one final question a little off the grid because you know uh, then again this is a sort of a, you know i'm getting a really invoke to ask you this because we've seen you working uh, though being you know a thorough professional at the helm of the affairs and still you were among the persons per, persons who were fighting for the women reservation bill i've seen you because we were young we were like watching you people over there listening to you so how do you see this particular move of the government for the women reservation bill your views how do you see this strengthening india the indian yes. women and the long fight for finally you know though uh, at least we are yeah. nearing some success you know jaya and for a lot of my career i was very anti quotas uh anti it because i believed that women were going to get there in their own right and for uh, you know a study i did when i took over as ceo of hsbc and i got the women we had largely at uh, the lower and middle management levels together they all said we don't want quotas we just want to be treated fairly and they didn't want quotas because the worry was that people would say oh you got there 
into a senior role. You got the job because you're a woman, not because you are good. And I think the backlash that they feared was was exactly that, that they would be seen as if they needed that helping hand. Having said that, I'm much later in my career, just looking at uh, the way bank directors, the, 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 the directors, uh, boards of directors that get established. Uh, we were down in the low teens, you know, shocking sort of six, seven percent of women representation on boards. Still, the government and through SEBI, the Stock Exchange Board of India, brought in legislation which mandated that there must be one woman on every listed company board or listed companies over a certain size. And lo and behold, in a period of four to five years, we went to north of 20%. Uh, so it changes very quickly when you have a legislation that helps you. So I think it really is about time. Sometimes you have to uh, push a regulation which enables it. And there were no sensical reasons by being raised by companies. Oh, we can't find the women. Uh, oh, there aren't enough women CEOs. Uh, but it's not as if every guy who was a director was an ex-CEO to, uh, who became a director. It's not as if every guy who came on the board had been a director somewhere else because someone has to do it for the first time. But these ridiculous reasons were being used to state why they couldn't get women. And so I think the regulation helps. And that is what will happen now with uh, the Women's Reservation Bill in Parliament. Uh, reasons being given on why you can't will now become where you have to. And then women will be there in their own right. And while they're in their own right, acceptance will return and there will be no reason for a quota. So I think that what we need to do is give it a big push and hope that the quotas are no longer required once people realize that it wasn't as difficult as they thought it would be. And that indeed the quality of discourse as we found on our boards the quality of discourse and representation in Parliament, uh, the right behaviour and proper behaviour, proper dress and all that that becomes part of the norm in Parliament actually helps raise the bar of the way people deal with each other and the issues that get discussed. Thank you so much. It is always really enlightening and enriching talking to you. Thank you for your profound views and we, are, we were very delighted and uh, very in, for your enlightening views. Thank you so much. We were so delighted to have you. Yeah. Thank you, Jaya. Thank you. Bye. Good luck.